this house was completed in 1838 by Charles Muskie for Francis Sorrell as a wedding gift to his second wife, Matilda. And it's important to know that this house was built on top of the uh, foundation for the British barracks that were destroyed uh, October the 9th, 1779 during the Siege of Savannah. There are a handful of British soldiers buried beneath our basement floor. And for more than 150 years, dating back as far as when this was an antebellum property with slaves on it, they have told stories about seeing soldiers in what they called red coats, mostly from the waist down, marching through the basement and passing through the walls. And even today, we have those very same sightings. So this house isn't just a house with a tragic past. It is built on top of a location with just as tragic, if not more of a tragic past. And that compounds and gives us the activity that we have today. We'll head on inside. Welcome to Sorrel Weed House. Thank you. Very nice. It's incredible to think about the historical figures that have passed through these doors. Because these are the original doors. And pretty much what you're going to see inside this house is original, with the exception of the furniture and the paint on the walls. But the very heavy mahogany doors, the moldings, the medallions in the ceiling, uh, the crown around each of the ceilings, it's all original. So that sort of adds to the, and feeds to the energy of the house. But I suppose if we were going to start a tour inside here, we would start just inside this room. Come on. Francis Sorrell's library. Now, as far as spooky activity goes, this is probably the only room in the house that I'm comfortable in day and night. Not to say that there isn't ghostly activity in here, it's just that it seems to be calmer in this room. But the very neat thing about this room is that this was used by that gentleman right up there, Robert E. Lee. Lee visited this house on numerous occasions over a 24-year period. He was very dear friends of Francis Sorrell's. And, well, in the winter of 61, 62, just before the Great War, Lee, General Lee, used this room as his office during his winter stay. And they say he spent many nights in the gentleman's parlor just across the hall, strategizing for his spring campaigns to come there in the gentleman's parlor. And it's a beautiful room, it's a grand room, but Again, I don't have very much spooky stories for this room. Like I said, this is where I usually camp out when I have to stay here for the night. So we'll head just across the hall where the real activity is going. Now, the Thrills, they enjoyed throwing some, some pretty big parties. They were known for their parties. In fact, from 1838, when this house was completed right up until 1860, right up until the very night that Matilda threw herself from the upper balcony, this was known as the party house here in Savannah. And it was in these parlors that those guests were treated to some pretty amazing evenings. Long tables spanning both rooms, uh, guests treated to an incredible dinner. Afterwards, though, the tables and furniture cleared out small band would set up in the corner and each evening would commence with dancing. And as the night wore on, guests would begin to drift away on the breeze as they do. And at that point, Matilda would invite the remaining ladies just inside there in the women's drawing room. And the gentleman would well, be entertained by Francis over here on this side. Now, these days, for the first, for the first 10 years that the homeowner lived in this house after restoring Sorrelli Mansion. Almost on a nightly basis, they were hearing the sounds of parties, big parties, echoing down here. 
Now, that sounds silly, but I'm gonna tell you that, that we hear it even today. And it's not just voices, it's full conversations. It is very old music playing in the distance. It doesn't sound like it's coming from next door, but it doesn't sound like it's in the room next to you either. It's just there, somewhere in between. We hear crystal being chimed on, followed by laughter, constantly. We can hear two women chit-chatting throughout the afternoon, and it sounds as if it's coming from the ladies' parlor, even though there is nobody in the ladies' parlor when we're hearing these, these voices. We've heard a lot of growls coming from that room as well. And there was an incident in between these two pocket doors here where myself and another investigator one night, uh, we were doing an investigation here. We had some guests in these rooms. And they got very, very uncomfortable. And they were doing an EVP session. Uh, they had their K2 meters. The K2 meters started to spike. And they started feeling what they described as just not very well. Uh, they, they got a little nervous and they raced downstairs. The investigator and I, we came up here and we've investigated together for a lot of years. Now he walks in between those doors and it is freezing cold in the drawing room and it is muggy and hot here in the gentleman's parlor. And when he gets in between those doors, he literally falls to his knees, crumpled. He's got the most terrible pain in his stomach and it just brings him to his knees. And I said, oh, come on, Gordon, you're, you're exaggerating. But I know this gentleman. We've investigated for a long time. Uh, he's not the type to exaggerate. So when I moved towards him to extend my hand and help him get up, when I stood in between the pocket doors, I got the same feeling as if something had just reached into my stomach and squeezed very badly. And I sort of hunched over, grabbing my gut. And we both felt... Um, very, very not well, I guess you could say. And it wasn't until we got out of the room that everything about us went back to normal. And that was only about a month ago. That and I've been on this property for three years. I've never experienced anything like that. And in all my years investigating, I've never experienced anything like that. I've been around others who have experienced things like that, but that was the first for me. And that happened right there. Interestingly, I will tell you, and I can even show you a little later, quite a few guests have captured apparitions in these rooms, full-bodied apparitions and photographs. Notably, I've received more images that were captured on site looking into the reflections of the gentleman's mirror and the ladies' mirror than I have in any other general part of the rooms. Each time something is captured in this mirror, it's over here in this area. And there is a photograph we have that we witnessed it being captured. It was captured in the middle of the tour on a digital camera. And there is a young woman standing back here with her head facing the back of the gentleman taking the picture in the mirror. He thought he was alone in this room. He was what we call the straggler, the person that sticks around longer than everyone else to get that last picture. The tour guide was standing just right back here encouraging this man to hurry it along. He'd already checked this room. He knew there was only one gentleman left. The gentleman believed he was alone. But when he snaps the photograph, he immediately realizes that in his photograph, there's a young woman standing right here. And the look on her face, and her face itself, is terrifying. It's very concerning. But the same episode happened over here on this side. On the night that my most infamous image was captured in this room, there were a dozen people on the tour that night. It was a very warm, late July evening. The gentleman takes a photograph looking into this mirror. He uses a flash. When he looks at his camera, he realizes the flash is dominating in the mirror. So just before he hits the delete button to take another photo, he notices in the background there's a woman standing right here that he doesn't recognize amongst the rest of the group. The group is all dressed for very warm summer weather. And again, there's only a dozen of them in here. The woman he sees standing here is wearing a blue antebellum style dress with a belled out skirt. She's got her hair coming over her shoulders. She's wearing a shawl or a cape because she's clutching it modestly under the chin. And this is a very, this dress is for cold weather. This is not a summer dress.
dress. It's very conservative. Her hair is coming over her shoulders and her face is nothing but what you could imagine a skull, a skeleton looking like if it was just flesh and bone. There was no, there wasn't much substance to her when we look at her face in this photograph. Again, it's on a digital camera. He's looking at it. Everybody in the room sees this photo on his display. And it created a lot of, a lot of stir in the group that night. And that, that tour did run pretty long because getting out of this room after somebody captured something incredible like that was an ordeal. There have been images, reflections of individuals captured by guests in our windows. And this window here. I have an image that I'll share with you later of a man resembling the general, standing just outside the ladies' parlor on the deck. And his face appears just outside, and he's got his head down and turned away a little bit, so you're seeing his profile. You're seeing his shoulders. He's looking down as if he were deep in thought. It's a pretty incredible image. From here, I'll take you to the dining room. I'll share with you what's going on in there. Now this is a house that will, will, will prove to guests that ghosts aren't just part of our nights here in Savannah. They are very much part of our daytime as well. And this is a room that proves it daily. Right over here. This was the Sorrell's private dining room. And really it would have just been Francis, Matilda, and their oldest child that would have dined in here. But what we're experiencing during the day has a lot to do with this chair. Now in the mornings they'll reset these chairs so that they're about like you see them now, just about two inches from the table. The dose will be standing just outside the doorway. And she'll hear this. Now you can hear that echo through these rooms. You really can. And if you're downstairs, you can definitely hear it. The reason we know it's this chair that gets pulled out is because it's immediately followed by a whack to the table. And when we come back in here, keep in mind, somebody's just standing 10 feet away when this happens. When we come back in here, this chair will be shoved all the way up against the edge of the wood. And they'll come back in here and they'll reset the chair until tomorrow. That occurs almost daily. What time this chair. of day is that? It has occurred around noon, between 12 and 2 p.m. Uh, during the mid part of the, the, the day. I have one particular docent who's here five days a week for the afternoon tours and they are the ones that experience it the most because they're the ones usually standing just outside in front of the stairs. So, why don't we head down, head down into the basement. Now, we call this a basement by default. But you have to imagine this really, truly is not a basement. Because when this house was completed, the streets were six and a half feet lower than they are today. So this was ground level. And with most antebellum homes, polite society did not live at ground level. They lived above everyone else. One, it was societal, but two, the streets were all dust and dirt, and so your main floor always was above the, the dirt streets. But down here, this was the working portion of the house. This is where the main kitchens are, the auxiliary kitchen, the linen room. Um, a handful of slave quarters would have been down here. And this is one of the main kitchens right here. This is, this is the hearth where a lot of the home's meals would have been prepared. And of course, if they were entertaining a lot of guests, they'd open up the second side as a kitchen as well. Now, before I tell you about the rooms behind me, 
I'll bring your attention to the floor. Because originally this had slate tile in here when this was the working part of the house. And in the 1950s, a family converted this basement, the courtyard, and the property in whole into a dress shop, a women's boutique named the Lady Jane. And they poured uh, several inches of concrete down on top of that tile, which was devastating. They just weren't concerned with historical preservation back then like we are today. In the mid-90s, when they began restoring this property, uh, they chipped away uh, all of that concrete. The tile was a complete loss. And they used these bricks, which are Savannah Grays. These are the slave bricks that people talk about. These used to be the wall that encompassed the property when it was first completed. And they were repurposed as the floor down here in the basement. Parapsychologists believe that Savannah Grays work like a battery. And it's part of what contributes to Savannah being such a haunted city is that uh, they're made from limestone and, and volcanic ash pulled from the riverbeds of the savanna. They were handmade by the slaves. And a lot of these bricks uh, contain the individual handprints and fingerprints of the individuals that crafted them. And people believe that they work very much like a battery, just like paranormal location situated next to large bodies of flowing water or high concentrations of uh, limestone or granite. Things that um, uh, store and conduct energy. And these bricks, some believe, do just that. But not even buried, scattered just below the surface are the remains of those British soldiers. Now they're not laid to rest, they're scattered because this was the site of barracks and those barracks were destroyed by cannon fire. The barracks collapsed, trapped those individuals underneath. It was recorded that when this house was being constructed by Klosky, they found numerous remains, but they simply just left them where they lied and continued to build. We rediscovered those remains when we were redoing this floor. And again, they're not buried underneath and they're not laid to rest. They are scattered about. And if I had to put a number on it, I'd estimate there's a, at least a dozen underneath here. So y'all just left them there? We left them where they lie, yes. Now, the reason we know that they're British soldiers is because along with those bones, we found all their uniform buttons. We found British bayonet components. We found dozens and dozens and dozens of British musket ball. And we even found a French cannonball buried in this foundation. Now it was the French that came along and supported the Patriots in 1779 with the siege. And specifically there was one French engineer who was leading a battalion of all Haitian soldiers about 400 yards out from the Bull Street center line, just beyond the wall, which was just out here in the square. That battalion, they lobbied the cannon fire that destroyed the barracks and the redoubt. And that, that French engineer that was leading that battalion, his name was Anton Sorel. And it's purely coincidence that his son some 50 years later, not being from Savannah, having been brought here by his job. And I'll remind you, after being abandoned by his father at a very young age, Francis comes along and purchases this property without any knowledge of a connection. He doesn't just purchase this property, he purchase, purchases four lots. He builds this house on two of them. And the other two remained his garden until he built his townhouse next door. But it was Francis' father that was responsible for those soldiers that are buried beneath his son's house. And it wasn't until after Francis' passing and Moxley, Sorrell, researched his ancestors that he came to realize his father's roots and 
his grandfather's connection to the property where he was raised, right here. Uh, I always just thought that was a very eerie coincidence. Very much. When you're investigating tonight, you should pay close attention to this particular area over here. Long before I ever came to Sorrell House, there were stories about how the tour guides used to present from over in this corner. And on so many occasions, their guests were treated to a shadowy figure stepping up behind that guide. It didn't take long before guides stopped presenting from this corner. And that shadowy figure, having been seen countless times by guests and photographed by these guests, they've dubbed him the Shadow Man. Now, I don't put a lot of stock in psychics and mediums. But when they do visit us, they tell us that there is an individual, a man who harbors in this corner here. And he's very possessive about his space and that he doesn't say much. But again, I don't put a lot of stock in psychics and mediums, but what I do put a lot of stock in is what I see and what I experience and what I witness when I'm here in the house. I myself have never seen Shadow Man, who is described as very tall and very thin. But what I have seen with my own eyes and what I have witnessed on our monitors, which are in the next room, is a shadowy figure not that, tall, not, not that much taller than me, pacing back and forth across this breezeway. Every time he's been filmed, I've been told they see him walk seven or eight times before he disappears again. But the one time that I witnessed him, I happened to be watching the monitors. When I saw this, I ran out here and gave chase. And he bolted, which tells me he's not residual. He's intelligent. Because if he was residual, I could have chased after him and it shouldn't have made a difference. But because I ran after him, he bolted. So I suspect that perhaps that is Shadow Man and maybe legends have just made him bigger than he is. Or we have two shadowy figures hanging out in this breezeway back here. One that steps out from that corner and one that paces back and forth along that entrance and along that breezeway. We've recorded a lot of EVPs on these stairs. What's very interesting is they're female voices almost every time. I mean, literally almost every time. And they're accented voices. They, uh, they sound English. They sound French. They, they have this heavy, thick gauge to them. And not just along the staircase, but in the space between the staircase and the wall, the, the, the space between those pillars. We've captured so many female voices in conversation, not, well, one said, get out of my way. And it was very rude about it. Get out of my way. But every other set of EVPs that we capture along that staircase almost sound like gossip or chit chat. So those are the little hot spots down here. But I think what you're really gonna be interested in is through those doors. We'll head in there. This was a linen room, I'll just mention real quickly. Uh, this is where they would have done a lot of their, their, their cleaning. Um, perhaps a few of the slaves that kept the house going and the fires going throughout the night would keep quarter down here. But they would have kept a cauldron of boiling water on this all the time. They would have kept wood down here to keep all the fires stoked. Um, they would have kept buckets of coal to keep fires going. Um, so this was a, this was a, a, a multi-purpose room with a focus on, on cleaning. But by 1845, Francis being a man who was very close with family, family was very important to him, he had a son, his eldest son, Frank, 
The problem he had with Frank was that Frank was the consummate learner and traveler. And he was a brilliant doctor and physician and surgeon. He was passionate about surgery and the healing process and saving lives. And he created a lot of procedures that, well, he would travel around the world sharing with other medical professionals. He's credited with developing and founding numerous techniques that went on to be used for a great long time. But Francis wanted to find a way to get his son to settle down and spend more time here at home, um, helping his community, being part of the community, and being part of the family. So he offers him this room and a wealth of the most modern equipment. Uh, acetylene lamps, tools, whatever he would need to further his studies and help his community. And he uses this room as his medical office, but most notably it's used as his medical surgery. And it's in this room that over nearly a decade, Francis Sorrell saved a lot of Savannian lives. Now he didn't really practice general medicine. He specialized in trauma. And you have to imagine that Savannah was in the midst of an industrial revolution at this period in its history. There was an, well, working down by the river on the docks and with all the equipment down there, it was uh, very dangerous. And he had a steady flow of business. It was in this room that he would perform those procedures. Now, medicine being what it was in those days, it wasn't always pretty. I'll turn on a light in here. It wasn't always pretty. Frank lost a lot of lives in here as well. And there is evidence that suggests to a lot of folks that this is probably one of the most active, physically active rooms in the house. It's in this room that on numerous occasions I've made contact with the spirit of a young boy. We call him Joseph. And we believe that he was not one of the Sorrell's children. He was a slave himself. In the tax records, he disappears. Uh, right around 58. And he was not even 11 years old when he falls off that tax record. But we watch him from the age of 3 to approximately 10 as being part of this property. And I have suspicions that he tended to the stables or kept his bed in the hay of the stables and something may have happened to him. But he is a very curious one that loves to chit chat. So I hope you make contact with him tonight. I've encountered him in this room many times. But as frequent as the shadow figure is seen in the breezeway, with greater frequency one is experienced inside here. The number one experience that my guests have when they visit this house is when they're in this room in the dark and they bump into somebody right here in this corner and they say, oh, I'm sorry, excuse me. Only to find out that the person they just bumped into just vanished. Or they're standing in this room because they're crowded. There's a lot of guests trying to be in this room all at once. And they bump into somebody and they, you know, will say excuse me and walk away. And they'll look at this person that they just bumped into and realize that all they're seeing is a, a full shadow figure. Just standing there with his arms crossed amongst the group amongst the crowd. Folks have sat here on this sofa posing for photographs and in numerous photographs discovered that sitting right beside them is a shadowy figure. I mean you can see it sitting here with its legs coming down, its back up against the back of the seat. It's sitting here just like this and they'll be sitting right here in the middle of the sofa posing for a photo and, and there's this figure. And we've We've seen this on so many occasions that now, if people Google search images of the Sorrel Weed House, they'll find numerous pictures on the internet of, of people posing on here with this 
not even so faint shadowy figure sitting beside them. Now it becomes an attraction. People come in here specifically wanting to get their pictures taken on this sofa, hoping that they'll see something sitting here with them. <coughs> it's in this room that guests feel a heavy weight on their chest. They get extremely uncomfortable in here. It's in this room that people feel like they've just walked into cobwebs. They feel it draping across their hair. Numerous young women have had their earrings tugged on or played with in these rooms. And we've even had a tour guide. And, and this is, I always love this story. We had a tour guide who was conducting a tour in here who actually had a dangly earring ripped right out of her ear. It was tossed across the room in front of her guest. The entire incident captured on our cameras. Now she wasn't hurt, but she was terribly frightened. And to be completely honest, that's actually that's actually how I got the job I have here at Sproul Weed House. I replaced her. Like I said, she wasn't hurt, but she also didn't want to give tours here anymore. But this is considered one of the most physically active rooms. Um, now other, other people have had experiences, physical experiences, over in that breezeway where the shadow man is supposed to reside. There is one other place in this basement area where we do have, on occasion, a more mm, not so pleasant physical encounter. But I hesitate to tell you about it or where it is because nobody's ever been hurt. It's more of a nuisance than anything. No one's ever been attacked or physically hurt. But there is a physical occurrence that does tend to happen from time to time with people who are less than respectful when they're down here. And it happened to Aaron on Ghost Adventures when they were filming here. It's happened to a half dozen of my guests over the last three years. And it's happened to one of my investigators about six weeks ago. And it correlates with another full-figured apparition sighting that is had with some regularity. I mean, should I, t do I, do I, should I tell you guys as investigators, do you want to know where that is? Or, or do you want me to just wait until you tell me what happened and then I tell you? You know what, sometimes I feel hesitant to tell people about that place and that, that occurrence because then it may manifest itself in that individual. You know what I mean? By all means. Location. It's right. Not necessarily what happened. Right in here. Right here. Uh, I do not know what it is about this place. But we will be out here in the courtyard. These doors will be open and we'll see something peeking around the corner right here. Numerous people have told me that they see somebody standing right here. Like, almost like they're guarding the door, or the doorway. And there's just a, a very large person. Now, I swear, and so does my, one of my investigators, who will be here later tonight, uh, checking in on the house. He believes he's seen that same figure standing on this side of the wall, of the doorway. But more times, he's been experienced and seen standing on this side. But it's in this doorway that people keep getting what they describe as being stabbed. But people keep telling us that they're getting stabbed. They get a stabbing pain in their side or in their back or in their hip or in their leg. And every time they do, they have a mark that's about one and a half to two inches. Well, not quite two inches, but one and a half inches in length. And it'll be here, or here, or here, or anywhere in this area, the midsection area. And we'll just watch it get redder and redder and redder and redder. And you'll start to see little, the blood blisters start to surface just under the skin. Like when you get a really good scrape. And it always catch, it catches people off guard. Uh, it's not like, a, like when you start getting scratched and you start to feel that burning sensation. You go, oh, what is this? And you kind of go like that, and you check it, and you start to realize that you've got scratch marks. It's almost like instantaneous, like you're being stabbed, like you're, you're just getting stabbed. 
And it was very interesting when it happened to Aaron because I don't put a lot of faith in Ghost Adventures. Don't quote me on that, but I don't. <laughs> but, but when that happened, I was here when they were getting their walkthrough. And I know that this was never explained to them. That this occurrence, that this what happens here, that was not part of their tour. They were not given that, that detail. Um, there's always something that will hold back with investigative teams. I'll give you a lot of the story, but I won't give it all to you because sometimes I like to see what you guys get and if it correlates with anything else that we experience regularly. He wasn't explained about this, but it, yet it happened to him when he was escalating things, I guess you could say. But I've also had numerous guests uh, in this area right here get scratched get scratched on their hip, get scratched on their back, get scratched on their stomach. I had a person get clawed right here just behind the neck. And it all sort of occurs right here in this little area. I've given that one up tonight, but keeping a few other things for myself. So. Do you remember when I was telling you about the Savannah Grays and that personal touch of the individuals that were manufacturing these bricks? I want you to look right here. There's three fingerprints, four fingerprints. Right there. Here are. Ah, I love these. Because you can actually stick your fingers right in there. There's three more. There's some more. There's some more. Sometimes people just don't believe that a physical object like this could work like a battery or could possess any sort of memory keeping abilities. <coughs> what is it about tape that makes that so believable that it can record a memory or a voice or a video onto a piece of tape and that is, is acceptable to our, to our minds but not a brick? Why couldn't the materials that make up this brick be just as capable as that piece of tape that we imprint a memory on using magnet? Because when you touch anything, you leave part of yourself behind. Exactly. And here we can see not only a handmade piece of material, but we can see the very fingerprints of the individuals that were making these. <coughs> so why couldn't these contribute to our activity but out here it's a lot easier to see the fingerprints in the bricks than it is to see them inside the, the basement so yeah you'll find them all over if you search the basement enough you'll find plenty you'll find just as many in there but you'll find them all through this courtyard now I'm gonna step out of the Sun The night that Matilda left, the Sorrells were throwing a party. Now again, they were known for their parties. But this party was different. This was They were going to celebrate Matilda being well. She had suffered long bouts of depression her entire life. For months and months and months, she had just been making herself physically ill with her depression. She'd lost three young children. Uh, she had taken her sister's children as her own, you know, yet she'd lost three of her own. But she was in good spirits, and this was going to celebrate her being in good spirits. 
Now that evening, March 27th, 1860, okay. but is it really? Yeah. March 27th, 1860? <laughs> Not that far. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> that, what a coincidence. That's your birthday though, March 27th. March 27th, 1860. Matilda's prepared for the party. She's been upstairs, she's gotten dressed, she's all dolled up. It was unusual when she came downstairs and saw the staff readying the rooms for the guests, but Molly was not there directing the staff. Now Molly, she had been on the property for only a little over a year. Frances had purchased her to be Matilda's right hand. And typically, she would find Molly downstairs directing the staff, getting the house ready. But she was not there. Wanting her assistance with a few last details, she assumes Molly must be out here in the courtyard if she's not in the house. She wouldn't be in the kitchen. So she comes out here and she discovers Molly is not out here in the courtyard either. She's not in the garden. She's not in the drive. She's not in the atrium. There's only one other place she could possibly be. And that was her room. Now Molly, like a lot of Francis' slaves, like most of Francis' slaves, had her quarters on the second floor, above the carriage house and stables. And originally the only access up there was via a staircase that was right here in front of Molly's door. And that staircase led to a balcony that ran the entire length. So Matilda goes up this staircase and without so much as a gentle knock on the door she opens up Molly's door assuming she'll find Molly well she does but Molly is in the arms of Francis devastated by this distraught after nearly a year of being so deep in depression that her life had almost become non-existent she is now thrown back into that downward spiral, quite literally. Because witnesses say that she calmly walked down the staircase and across the drive and into the house. And nobody thought anything of it. Until only minutes later, they find Matilda on that upper balcony outside her room, clinging to the railing in tears, sobbing, shouting out just obscure things, having a, a fit of what they called lunacy. Francis now coming down the stairs and into the courtyard, into the drive and pleading with Matilda to calm down, to step back from the balcony, to step back from the railing, to not let the children see her like this before anybody can get upstairs and get to Matilda's aid she quote let's go and she tumbles down head first right into the black flagstone that the driveway was made out of and she lands head first right about where that palm tree grows today in what was described as quote a crumpled mess and that was the end of Matilda's story. It was only two weeks after Matilda's death that Molly was discovered in her room dead, hung by a rope from the rafters. And that too was very quickly and very suspiciously written off as just another suicide. Now there are lots of legends and lore that surround Savannah and the Sorrelweed house. One of which is that Matilda's vengeful spirit haunted Molly and drove her to hang herself. But as what little staff was here during that occurrence, they believe that Molly was murdered because there were no objects in her room in which she could have stood on to tie a rope to take her own life. She would have needed somebody's help if she was gonna tie a rope to those rafters.
she was very short in stature and her bed was on the floor and her belongings were a couple baskets and a small stool for sitting that was it she was found hanging in there and a lot of people wanted to blame Francis because he had disappeared for two weeks. After his wife's suicide, Savannah is full of gossip and rumors. Francis is in Virginia at the Moxley estate mourning the death with his family. There's very few people on this property at the time when this happens. And then she's killed. And people think that Francis had something to do with his wife's death and Molly's death because he wasn't here to defend himself. Worse though, and even the family suspects that Molly may have actually been murdered at the hands of one of Francis's sons. An act of revenge. Other people suspect that it was his business partners because Francis again wasn't here defending himself against rumors and gossip and they knew that they needed to fix this that there needed to be loose ends tied uh, according to one business partner's letter to Francis but they also don't believe that Francis was capable of doing this himself because they believe that this was a romantic affair not a typical antebellum affair, if you know what I mean. Maybe the business partners conspired with one of Francis' sons. Maybe they put one of Francis' sons up to it. Or maybe one of Francis' sons acted alone out of revenge. We'll never know. But all I can do is present to folks these days the variety of theories that both family and historians have regarding Molly's demise. Why don't we go up there? I'll take you guys up to that spot and you can see it for yourself. This was the carriage room. Carriages pulled in from the alleyway through this door right here, through this door here. This was a door. You can still see the hinges outside on the walls where the door swung from. This was all a drive. So carriages pulled in from the alleyway through this building and into the drive. There were stables on the other side of this building, although most of the coach horses were kept in the, in the city stables just a couple blocks away. The only horses they would have had in here would have been riding horses uh, for getting around you know Francis and, and Moxley and Frank and they each would have had a few studs in there this staircase was put in 2005 because the homeowner he committed to converting this into a living space for his caretaker and carpenter that were here on the property at the time now they had been living in the fourth floor of the mansion for over a year and they had been become quite accustomed to the activity that one experiences on a property like this. But when they turned this into a pair of apartments and they moved in here, they lasted less than two months before they claimed that activity was so intense they no longer cared to reside here on this property, regardless of how inclusive the rent was with the job. Within days of moving off the property, both of these men individually resigned from a very lucrative 20-year project. To this day, nobody has ever used this building as any sort of living space and even most of our day staff that do our historical tours, they refuse to come in here. They'll send their guests in here for a self-guided tour of the building, but there's only one or two that will actually come in here themselves with their guests. And then, of course, my ghost tour staff, we come in here. Um, so we'll come right up here. The living space up here was communal, for the most part. Uh, if you look right here in the floor, you'll see some marks where there used to be a wall right here, long before this staircase existed, because that was a kitchen area for the slaves. They would have prepared their meals there. They would have had their meals there. 
and from about where that wall is all the way up to right here, this was all a communal living space for those slaves. From the other side of this wall to this brick wall, this was a hayloft. And hay would have been brought in from the alley side, and then it would have been kicked down towards the stables down below right here. So this doorway wasn't here. This is a new doorway. Because keeping in mind the only access to this upper floor was from outside, this doorway was put in in 2005 when they wanted to make this a living space, and this became a bedroom. This bedroom was Molly's room. This was her very room. And the only thing that has changed about this room since she last physically occupied this space is that this doorway has been put in and some paint has been put on the walls. But the beams and rafters that are in that room are the very beams and rafters that she was found from. And it's inside that room that she spent her short time on this property, a little over a year. And it's inside that room that she fought for her life and that she lost her life. In 2005, when TAPS came here to film their very first ever live Halloween special, this was, at that time, still that living space for the caretaker and carpenter. This was... They'd only been here six weeks living in this building. After the investigation, there was no more living in this building. But it was in that room that they captured their most prolific EVP, the sounds of a young woman screaming pleading for her life, and a muffled male voice captured beside hers. Now she is screaming, she's got a thick, heavy accent. She's screaming, help me. Oh God, no, leave me alone, get out of here. Oh God, please help, no. And you can hear this muffled voice just you know, and then it stops. Now when they recorded that, they captured banging and thumping like things were being thrown around in here on their audio recorder. And it was, the banging was so loud that while they were conducting a live interview on television downstairs in the courtyard, they're hearing the banging as if furniture was being thrown around in here. Now they came up here, they found nothing out of place, but eight minutes prior to the banging, they realized they've captured this woman screaming for her life. Now that night, a lot of people don't know this, but when they, when they roll out to, to film an episode, they're not showing up in a bunch of black vans. They're showing up with 40 or 50 production people. And they've got 10 to 15 production trucks. And the alleyway was filled with production trucks. They had craft services and catering. And they had security posted on all sides of the property. Nobody at any time ever heard a young woman screaming for help. Yet on the audio recorder, it sounded as if it was just feet away from the microphone. But nobody heard that woman screaming for help. So that was captured inside that room. Now. I do not go in this room. I don't. But I have my own reasons why I don't go in this room. And I don't generally talk about them when I'm on the property. I have been in there before. I've been in there once during the day. I've been in there at night. I don't stay in there and I don't go in there very frequently. I, I really avoid that room. I believe that if she, still, if she does still occupy that space, She'd probably just prefer I not be in there because I am a guy, I am a gentleman, I'm just a guest on this property. And I figure the last time she was physically in that room there was a man in there with her and it didn't end well for her. And because I like to keep myself on the good side of the spirits, I just keep a respectful distance if you know what I mean. But you guys are more than welcome to go inside there and when my investigator gets here later tonight he's going to tell you a story about something that happened to me inside this building last night last night last night now you guys know that we do uh like i mentioned we do a paranormal investigation 
um, twice a week. We do Friday and Saturday nights. It's limited to a dozen guests. I prefer Gordon tell you this story even though it happened to me because I did not stay last night to investigate. Uh, I went home. I was exhausted after uh, what happened. There is a large dog on this property that belongs to the homeowner and he's here this week visiting. Okay. He leaves this dog alone for long periods of time and he's okay in the house. He stays upstairs, keeps to himself, pretty happy-go-lucky dog. I've got full tours last night. The house is filled with people, the courtyard's filled with people, and this dog is going bonkers, barking, just going crazy. And I'm thinking, oh man, this is, this is not good. But I'm also terribly afraid of dogs. <laughs> so I wasn't exactly gonna go up there and try to calm him down, especially because he's bigger than me. But I wanted to see if the service door upstairs on the balcony had gotten open because it sounded like the dog was on the balcony. So I came up here came up here and I stood right in front of that window right there. And if you stand in front of that window, you can look up onto the upper balcony and you can see the service door underneath the railings. Now, if you look out that window and you look on that balcony, look to your right, um, it might be difficult to see during the day. It was easy to see at night because the room was lit up back there. But I was looking to see if the service door was open and it was, so that told me the dog had gotten on the balcony. And I figured the dog was just barking because there was lots of people in the yard, even though he generally doesn't bark when we're doing tours. While standing there, I started getting a freezing chill down the right side of my body. I was standing right where you're at, right there. Got this freezing chill down the right side of my body and I looked over to the right. And you know how when you're looking at a bright light and you're in a dark room, when you turn, you still kind of see that light, it, you know, that burns into your eyes and you got to let your eyes adjust and you blink a bunch of times. I looked this way and it was my eyes were just kind of messed up from staring at this bright light in the darkness and I was letting my eyes adjust. I was blinking a lot and I thought I saw somebody standing in just behind the doorway of Molly's room. And I started thinking, oh, well, um, it's just my eyes because I was looking at a bright light. I'm just seeing things. So I turn around this way, I'm looking, I don't see anything. I look back out the window, everything's fine. I turn back towards Molly's door again, and now I see it even more than just faint. Like at first I just thought, oh, I'm just seeing a shadow being cast. But now I'm seeing a more solid shadow, if you know what I mean, um, standing there. And I started thinking, well, wait a minute, why am I seeing a shadow? Because Molly's room is pitch black and there's no lights on up here. There's no reason I should see a shadow because there's no light casting into her room for there to be a shadow to be seen. And I realized that Molly's room had a blue glow to it, kind of like the blue of the night sky. You know that it's so dark, it, it's not black, but it's still blue, but it's just real dark. Her entire room was backlit with this blue. And it, the more I stood at it, the more solid that shadow became. And then I said to myself, I'm not seeing anything. There's a person standing there. And so I shouted at them, very authori authoritative. Hey, what are you doing up here? And then they didn't say anything. Now I'm still standing right there. And I said, I can see you come out of there. And at that point, it came out of the room all right and it came fast and it came all the way to right where your camera is to the edge of that counter and it stopped right there dead in its tracks right about where you're standing and I stared at it and it stared back at me even though it didn't have eyes and at that point I turned and ran my butt down those stairs and when I got outside the carriage house I stood in the doorway thinking what the hell just happened who the hell did I just see? Because it was not a person. When it came out of the room, it was just a solid black shadow that was three-dimensional. Might as well have been. And when it moved, it moved its arms a little bit like this. And it moved at a fast walk. That's how fast it, it didn't like charge like it was running. It just walked very fast with purpose. 
it stopped right there. And from there to there, I can see it just like I'm seeing you, only it had no features. It was just, it was just black shadow. And when I came out of the courtyard, there was another investigator from another paranormal team that was, that I'd been hanging out with and we were in the seating area. <coughs> and I went back and I sat down and my heart was racing and I was just white as a ghost as they say. And I thought, or I was trying to figure out how to say, what to say, how to, I was still absorbing what had just happened. And he goes, man, you look like you just saw, and then I'm not gonna tell you what he said, because it was, it was a joke. Not one for the cameras. I said, no, and I stuttered. I said, no, 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 no. And I just kept looking at my feet and trying to get my heart to stop racing. He says, man, you, you look like you've seen a ghost. But I know that wouldn't freak you out because you work here all the time. You see them all the time. And I said, and I tried to explain to him what had just happened. And the way he saw it be relayed from me, there was no doubt in his mind that I was telling him the truth. And when my other investigator got here and I told him about it, he told me that the week prior, he was closing up at the end of the night and he thought he saw somebody standing in Molly's door. And they were so real that he yelled at them saying, hey, how'd you get in here? Why are you in here? Because it's two o'clock in the morning, he's locking up to go home. And he realized he was shouting at nothing because there was nobody there. When he turned on the light and he walked in there, there was nobody in there. But he had never told me about it. And yet it happened the following Friday to me. Only when I told them to come out of there, they did. And they came out into the room. And I split. So that's what happened last night. So if you see something in that room, yell at it. Tell it to come out. Tell it you see it and tell it to come out and see if it does it like it, like it did to me. Because it freaked me out. And I have seen plenty of things and heard plenty of things and experienced plenty of things. But that, in all my years on this property was the most heart pounding because it chased or it because it moved out of the room so quickly as if it were coming after me. And I've never experienced anything coming at me. When I've seen stuff, I've seen stuff just standing there. I've seen something just posing there or I've heard something or I've heard footsteps walking behind me. But this was different because it it came after me. So it was very compelling. And you missed that. You were at Moon River. You should have been here last night. But anyways, that's my story. That's the Sorrel property. That's it. Now, I've got a tour in 30 minutes that i got to give. But later tonight, uh, when you guys are investigating, I'm going to show you where Molly's buried. Because it's right beneath us. I just don't have time to take us there now. But i got to get ready for a tour. <coughs> but... What all? We'll have access to this. Mm-hmm. Car's floor, Here you go. basement. Yeah, what you have access to is the main floor of the house, where the parlors, the library, and the dining room are. Then you'll have the entire basement area and both floors of this carriage house. And is it just the three of you or is it, yeah? Okay. I don't typically let people go down there because it is very dangerous. But you can have access to the wine cellar as well, if you want. That's the lowest. Is there any wine down there? The upper floors? Yeah. No, it's private residence, and the homeowner is here this week. Yeah. Um, that's where the big dog is. It's bigger than you, bigger than me. And um, not a big person. And, uh, and, and the homeowner, uh, he was supposed to, he was going to leave today, but he, that's, things came up. He was sticking around. So, but we, we really, we never allowed the. Even ghost 